fellow friends, happy Monday, and welcome to another episode of Quandaries and Sundries, where we cover the science and history news of the day, and hopefully expand your knowledge, or at least give you a break from all the craziness of your day-to-day, and hopefully give you a break from yours. I hope you're all doing well today, and if not, I hope it can help soothe your worry and anxiety. But before we get into this, if you're all listening on YouTube, I'd really appreciate it if you would give this video a like, a comment, and if you're new to my content, consider subscribing. Or if you're listening to this on Spotify, or the audio platform of your choice, consider following. Any feedback is greatly appreciated. So sit right back, get comfortable, and let us get right into it. Today, we are going to talk about pollination. The method of reproduction for 80% of all plants on our planet and affects at least 40% of the world's entire food crop supply. The process involves the substance called pollen that many, including me, are allergic to. Today we'll be talking not about trees, but just the average flowering plant to get to a basic understanding of pollination in the study I will be talking about. For most flowering plants to reproduce, they need to have their pollen carried from one plant to another via a pollinator. The most common pollinators are commonly bees, hummingbirds, and bats, and even the occasional moths. Let us take bees as an example. They land on a flower, collect nectar from it, to use in their honey, and as they land, pollen becomes collected on their legs. And when they land on another flower, the pollen gets transferred to this new flower. This is how plants reproduce, and this is how pollination happens to hundreds of thousands of plant species around the world in one way or another every year. Now, the reason I'm talking about pollination today is because of a recent study involving the relationship between the evolution of moths and the evolution of various plant species, a process called pollination shifting in which a flowering plant changes from one pollinating partner to another. An example would be from a hummingbird to a moth. Such shifts also give rise to new species. A mystery that has always puzzled scientists and famously perplexed Charles Darwin. Such a process has been linked to 300,000 distinct flowering species on our planet and throughout history. But how does such a shift happen? Well, scientists now have an answer. Each pollinator is attracted to certain traits a flower has, which separates various species of plants and various species of pollinators into their own co-evolutionary relationships. And by altering a few genes in a flower and changing its appearance, and more notably its colors, it attracts certain species of pollinators and even can alter the evolutionary path of said pollinator. Let's say we have a hummingbird going to the same species of flower for thousands of years, and either through environmental changes or from crossbreeding, from pollen being carried to the wrong flower, the flower's genetic code is altered and evolves to have a vase-like opening. And in order to access it, a longer tongue is needed. In order for that hummingbird species to survive, it will need to develop a longer tongue, or a proboscis over the span of thousands of years through evolution and adaption in order to not become extinct. At the same time, let us say the flower is desperate to survive and needs the attraction of a new pollinator because either its old pollinator species died out for some reason or it's close to becoming extinct itself. The flower will evolve over time and make a shift by changing its color and traits and attracting a new partner to pollinate it. Such dynamics and shifts made it possible for many of the species of pollinating plants to exist, and many of the pollinators to evolve, giving us such a diverse ecosystem over millions of years. So interestingly, it only takes a few simple genes to change the result in the creation of a new species of flower or pollinator. Charles Darwin famously hypothesized that a specific white orchid species that had an opening that was about 35 centimeters would need a hawk moth with a tongue about 35 centimeters for the flower to survive. It was just a hypothesis, and he did not get to observe it with his own eyes, 
But decades later, scientists observed such a behavior because, like I said, certain pollinators are attracted to certain traits. Hawk moths prefer yellow, pink, and white flowers because their visual sensitivities do not allow them to perceive red. Well, on the other hand, hummingbirds are attracted to the red of flowers, so it became their preference. Last week, I talked about the flowering plants taking over from the conifers and ferns in prehistoric times. And while reading the study, I could not help but think of how this codependent relationship probably greatly helped repopulate the planet after the Great Cretaceous Extinction. And over the 10 million years span it took for life to return to normal, such a process of flowering and pollinator partnership and the process of pollinating genetic shifting was probably perfected, giving rise to the life we have today. Now the study using the hawk moth was in a confined laboratory setting, so it will be interesting to see what will happen once the study is taken into the wild, and if we will be able to alter flowers now by forcing this DNA altering change. Such a revelation is important, because as the bee population drops, we will need to think about how our crops will alter and evolve themselves to find a new pollinating partner. And I also wonder if such an alteration would affect our crop's tastes as well. Such a discovery can help us better pave a way to predicting the future evolution of flowering plants as well as their pollinators, alter them better genetically to survive extinction, and even give us a better look into the co-evolutionary family trees of not just flowers, but also pollinators. Well, that is all I got for today. Before I go, I would like to thank everyone for the feedback on last week's change. I will be going forward with this new format and hope you will look forward to what I release next. I would like to thank you again for joining me for another episode. Do not forget to share this podcast to all those in your life who could use a scientific moment in their life. I wish you goodbye, my friends. I hope you never forget to grow and never stop searching for knowledge and always trust your scientific nose. I hope you will join me next week for another episode of Quandaries and Sundries. Stay safe, stay sound, stay healthy. Always question your logic and reality. Do not be afraid to follow the truth and do not forget to stay informed. This is Van Masterson signing off.